So my name is Patrick Flammer. I'm an editor for Genome Medicine and BMC Medical Genomics, and I'm joined here by Aniel at the Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, thank you for taking the time. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen your talk and uh, I, th I found it actually quite interesting that there's not enough work done on, on mitochondrial uh, DNA because everything is, is just in, in the nucleus and uh, I mean, even, even um, in lectures sometimes you just hear like, oh, the, it just produces energy and um, yeah, that, that's all you need to know. So how, how did you get to uh, work on, on mitochondria? Uh, <laughs> so I, 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 I was trained as a telomere biologist, so I did telomere work for my PhD and for, for my postdoc. And I started my lab having proposing to work on telomeres and the link between telomere and DNA repair. And then at some point, two years into my own lab, I, I thought I'm just becoming a bit too telocentric <laughs> and I wanted a bit of a challenge. And I had fascination in mitochondrial DNA. Mm. I, I, like everyone, we learned about it in college and in high school, and it's always this like endosymbiosis that's a bit boring sitting in the cytoplasm. Mm. It's actually the biology is fascinating, it's complex, and we know very little about it. Yeah. Anyhow, so I thought, let me write a foundation grant. Yeah. I did some reading, I took one month off, just read mitochondrial literature. I thought, yeah. I'll write a proposal, and if it gets funded, I'll hire someone and we'll work on it. And so fast forward f seven years later, I've got six people in my lab working on it. We've got more than one grant and it's been super fun and super exciting. There's so much interesting biology and so many fundamental questions about that genome that we don't know. And, and we're having a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I, I think it's the, the, the fact that we don't know that much about mm -hmm. it is that uh, why people just don't think about it. It's, it's sort of the, it's ingrained, oh yeah, it just produces some energy. So what, um, the, the double stamp breaks in, mm -hmm. uh, in the mitochondria, how are they different from the one in, in the nucleus? Yeah, so it's, it's quite very different because the first thing that happens when you break the DNA in the nucleus, you have to fix it. Yeah. You've got two copies, you can't afford not yeah. to fix it, right? In the mitochondria, in mammalian cells, once you make a double-stranded break, the first thing, you, it's not fixed, it's not repaired. Right. It gets yeah. degraded. Yeah. And then I guess the idea there is you've got many copies. Right. So as long as the system is alerted that the DNA is gone, then you replicate the, the intact genomes and that's how you make up for the lost ones. So there's no, f f the, the repair is incredibly rare in the mitochondria and when it happens, it's mutagenic, it leads to deletions often. So, and some people have this uh, notion or the hypothesis that repair was shut down because mm. to, to reduce mutation rates because so that often repair is mutagenic, so completely shutting it down is, is more beneficial. So on one hand, there's no repair, right? Yeah. But then also the, the, the mitochondria is it's not, it's not chromatinized, it's in yeah. nucleoids, but it seems, but somehow it need, needs to send a signal to the nucleus. So I, I guess maybe I can take a step back and, and explain a little bit. So the mitochondrial DNA codes for 37 genes that yeah. are essential for respiration. But the mitochondria itself has 1,500 proteins. All right. of them are transcribed in the nucleus, translated in the cytoplasm, and delivered to the mitochondria. Yeah. So every protein that's required for DNA replication, metabolism, whatnot, is in the nucleus. So it's very important for these two organelles to cross-talk. So when, mm. whenever that genome in the mitochondria is perturbed, is in trouble, a signal needs to somehow make it to the nucleus yeah. so that polymerases are sent, helicase is sent, SSB is sent, and so on and so forth. So a few years back, we really started by asking a simple question. Does the nucleus sense a break in the mitochondria, and if so, how? Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and we well, well, we would assume so because they they would need uh, some some sort of repair or you need yeah, something, something right? like yeah. or, or if you lose your DNA, yeah. you really need to 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 replicate yeah. it. So well, and and so a postdoc in my lab basically just we made talents 
that have a mitochondrial localization signal. Yeah. So they specifically go and cut the genome, whatever we want them. And, and basically, we express those talents in cells, and we express talents that had no nuclear activity as a control. And what we was astounding is that an um, innate immune signature yeah. was quickly turned on in the cells that got these talents, saying that basically, when you challenge the DNA, that endosymbiosis <laughs> is no longer perfect, and oh that right. mitochondria yeah. is kind of perceived as a foreign, as yeah. a non-self entity. And from there, we worked our way to ask, how is it that that sense signal is sent? Mm. Yeah. And it turns out it's a very interesting way where you get herniation of the mitochondria. Right. So the mitochondria has double membrane. Yeah. Once, once something happens in the matrix, you get the formation of these macropores of backpacks yeah. on the outer membrane. Right. That leads to like spooling and herniation of the inner membrane. So anything from the matrix is dumped in the cytoplasm. It's picked up by pattern yeah. recognition receptor, and that's how it sends the signal to the nucleus. So that, that's, uh, that's more like a self-destruct me uh, mechanism, nearly, if the, if the membrane alters its, uh, its structure so, so um, drastically. Yeah, so the idea there would be then the nucleus will have to deal with it. Either it's going to trigger mitophagy or it's going mm, yeah. to sh shut, uh, close that herniation. Mm. Something needs yeah. to happen for, to, to re-establish homeostasis, yeah. right? So the goal here at the end of the day, you're going to quickly deal with the issue to re-establish homeostasis yeah. quickly and allow cellular function to keep going. Yeah, yeah, because they, they, if the um, because you said the mitochondria doesn't produce any of the um, uh, upkeep uh, mm -hmm. um, proteins, any anything, any of the enzymes that would be needed. So, why do you think they, they, there isn't a simpler mechanism that they just send for help for to get specifically these um, repair enzymes? Yeah, actually, I don't know if, if the innate immune sensing itself is the signal or it's, it's an unpleasant outcome. Because right. in a more recent work we've done, we've noticed that actually in a small fraction of cells that get a break, yeah. what happens is there is an integrated stress response pathway that's activated. Yeah. And, you know, integrated stress response pathway is such response to any um, a various number of yeah. stressors right yeah but it turns out there is a sensor in, in the in between the mitochondrial membranes that basically once you lose membrane potential or once um, the, yeah. the christi structure is deformed you lose this protein is cleaved it's called deli one it's cleaved yeah. by a protease so it goes to the cytoplasm activate kinase then then activates yeah the whole integrated stress response. So I think in that integrated stress response, its major function, right, is to block translation and re try to reestablish homeostasis yeah. through ATF4 and CHOP. And yeah. this is what we actually see. Right. We don't understand the link between the integrated stress response and the innate immune signaling, but it would be interesting to understand which one of this is required for mitochondrial DNA metabolism and whether there's a link or not. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, I mean, the, the, um, then there has to be a fast response if there's DNA breakage. But um, yeah, so I, I could, the only thing I can imagine is it's either to get rid of the mitochondria because we've got spare ones um, or to fix it as quickly as possible. Yep. So it's, although I would have assumed that because the, the cell, the nuclear uh, repair mechanisms are actually quite efficient and mm -hmm. relatively, you know, uh, uh, like error free. Um, so why do you think the the uh, repair in the mitochondria is so bad in a sense? Yeah, you know there, there's also a couple of um, articles in the literature that explain there are some repair proteins yeah. that make it to the mitochondria, right? But it's clear if you make a break, um, you start losing mitochondrial DNA content yeah. until the source of the break is removed and then you go, the mitochondria is recovered, the DNA is recovered and goes back to the same set point it was before the break, right? right. So there's two things here. The first, there's very poor repair. Yeah. And actually, if you try to reconstitute repair in the mitochondria, if you yeah. put end joining back, yeah. and this is a fun experiment we did, you start accumulating deletions. Saying okay. that when you get the 
when you basically when you get the break, you lose. It's, there's degradation, so pol yeah. gamma exoactivity, yeah. MGME one exo yeah. start degrading around it. So if you bring end joining, you start deleting the genes. And remember, there's no intron in the mitochondria. Every course, base yeah. codes for a gene, course, so you do yes. not want to make yeah. neither small deletion nor yeah, mutation. Yeah, so, so I think from um, it makes. Since you've got multiple copies, I think it's yeah. most effective to, once you make a break, degrade that DNA. Yeah. Now, the interesting part is that there seems to be a memory or a set point for copy number. So okay. if you're a muscle cell, you've got 10,000 copies of DNA, of mitochondrial yeah. DNA. If you introduce break and you cleave 999, 99% of them, that 1% that's left will repopulate quickly and go back to the same set point. But it doesn't, doesn't produce more? It just goes back to the same set oh, point okay. that it was before break. So, and this, how is this copy number yeah. regulated? It's actually a fascinating and really fundamental question that yeah. we have no clue about. Yeah. If you're a fibroblast or an epithelial, you've got much less empty DNA. Yeah. And if you cut these genomes, whatever, then it goes back to the same level. And if you're a muscle or a neuron, it's higher and goes back higher. And if you're an ES cells, it's lower and stays low. So this question of how this mitochondrial DNA copy number regulated, yeah. what is that memory that's there? It's, it's quite it, fascinating. Yeah, it, it seems to be a quite fundamental um, question, but uh, not not an easy one to resolve. I would I would imagine it's a because I, I can't think of, of um, Exactly what what would uh, what would regulate uh, such a controlled? Um it's tightly regulated, very yeah. tightly controlled. We have no clue about the underlying mechanism. I also have to say that it's not so easy to to work on mitochondrial DNA mm. because it's not so easy to manipulate the genome. Yeah. We use CRISPR-Cas9 to edit any gene we want mm. in the nucleus, but we always have to remember that you've got two membranes, the inner membrane of the mitochondria is negatively charged, so oh you yeah, can't course, send yeah. the DNA and RNA, right? So all this cool and, and mm. funky gene editing stuff that we do in the nucleus, we have to be kind of creative in how we, we try to manipulate the mitochondria genome. And that has limited quite a bit of, of study f of that genome. Yeah, probably people could, could not be bothered because it's really hard to do. Yeah, yeah, right. And so this is why we yeah. we have to use talents when we want to yeah. make breaks or restriction enzymes. You can't just, you can't send a guide RNA and yeah. do CRISPR. So, so uh, modifications of the of the mitochondrial genome is not really possible? Or? It's, it's limited to talents, yeah. base editors or talent nucleases, zinc fingers and, yeah. and restriction enzymes at, at this level. Yeah. There are some, a lot of work being done to try to, to bypass the inner membrane and yeah. send um, PNAs or DNAs or something, but I mm. think it's still not as efficient as you would need it to be in order to do these manipulations. Yeah, I, I like did yeah, the other. Tag it, for example, yeah. right? You want to put the first thing you want to do is put a GFP or RFP yeah. in the mitochondrial DNA that you cannot do. Yeah, so you, have to, you have to think out of the box and uh, exactly. come up with, uh, with new, um, new ways to, to, uh, to work with it. It's, it is, it's something that is, sort of, is baffling that there is still so little known and uh, well, we, we we know what the the proteins do that the, the genome expresses, but uh, the mitochondrial genome. But I don't know. Don't think there is that much known about um, how the interaction works with the with the nucleus. Yeah, there's a beautiful work done in yeast in the 80s, um, 70s, and 80s, um, where they uh, map the RTG genes, the retrograde. Mm. Uh, genes, RTG yeah. 1, 2, and 3, and this is Ron Butow did this work. And it turns out these genes are not conserved in higher eukaryotes, okay. but in model organisms like flies and worms, um, the unfolded protein response, the mitochondrial yeah. unfolded protein response seems to be the dominant way by which and then mitochondria yeah. contacts the yeah. nucleus. But in, in mammals, it's way more complex because you've got calcium signaling, you've got the innate immune response, and you've got the integrated stress response. So it's, there's more than one way yeah. by which 
the signal is sent, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So and I'm sure there's more. <laughs> yeah, there, there will be more. It, yeah. It's as soon as you you get to mammalian cells, everything gets gets a bit more Amplified. complex. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, the um, the interaction of uh, so the um, I lost I lost my my train of thought. Um, so you, uh, the the double membrane of the of the mitochondria. Yeah. So the, the inner one has a is is um, different. How how is that? Uh, does that make any any difference for the for the pr uh, protein uh, the, the transport of enzymes and proteins from the um, that are encoded in the nucleus? Yeah, there's they, they need to have an import signal. Yeah. And there are import machineries. Yeah. That cross the double membrane. This is how yeah. things go in there. So right? so. You, and uh, so a, yeah. one one trick people recently has been done yeah. is basically to leverage the protein import yeah. to try to smuggle in. Yeah, that, DNA, I, was, right? I was I was going. And so yeah, going so that there way. was there is a there was a recent paper in which they fused they did a chimera yeah. of a protein uh, and a, yeah. and a nucleic acid and it went but it only they were only able to do it when they took the mitochondria ex vivo <laughs> did. The, the yeah. import and then implanted them back in a cell. If they yeah. try to do it in a live cell and, and, and they did it yeah. in a fish, you can't. Yeah. Something degrades the DNA. So there's something in the inner membrane oh. space that seems to be degrading the oh, DNA. That's, so that's, that's um, really, really interesting. Yes. So it's kind what? of protecting itself yeah. from invading yeah. nucleic acids, basically. This is, yeah, this is it's very, because I, I thought if you, if you could, there's certainly things going in. So you should be able to do a piggyback on on yeah. something like that, but um, and I was just and I'm sure this is going to be one of the means by which yeah. we get there, but it needs more optimization yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. So it, because it, it's, it, I thought it uh, naively thought it would be more straightforward, but uh, yeah. this is actually, <laughs> this is very interesting that there is a, a defense mechanism. Yeah. Um, which is not something I would expect, uh, given that the mitochondrium has sort of given up most of its uh, of its genome towards the nucleus. But so yeah, RNA and DNA. It's the inner membrane is negatively charged, and you don't need you you don't want the RNA from the cytoplasm yeah. basically to make its way to yeah. the mitochondria. Um, but you know, maybe in five or ten years we'll come back. And this and would be a history. It's already yeah. done and solved. And it was like, oh, I remember 10 yeah. years when we were we talking about <laughs> this being an issue. <laughs> well, let, let's hope we actually get into that yeah. uh, point soon. Uh, because there's, there's definitely, I, I think there, there needs to be more, more work on mitochondria because they're really fascinating and yeah, very essential. Nothing, nothing would happen without mitochondria. And that's uh, that's actually good. Nothing will happen without mitochondria. I will use that. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, an important genome for it's, sure. Yeah, and uh, the function is is so so crucial for everything. Yeah. And so I'm I'm always uh, fascinated to hear more about uh, research that's going on on the mitochondria because yeah. And actually, if you think about there's there is a challenge inherent to having two genomes that are subject to different mutation rate and to yeah. different organelles, right? Because like you've got complex one, three, four, and the, mm. the respiratory yeah. complexes, they have subunits that are made in the mitochondria, but also subunits made in the nucleus. And they somehow fit together, right, yeah. for, uh, for yeah. ATP production. Now, yeah. if you've got a point mutation in, in, in a gene in the mitochondrial DNA, and you make that subunit that have this mutation at the surface of the interaction. Yeah. You, you could cripple oxidative phosphorylation. Yeah. So the nucleus has to co-adapt and co-evolve with yeah. that. So uh, how these two genomes kind of coexist, co-adapt, and co-evolve uh, is, is just really a fundamental and fascinating mm. question. Yeah, I, even the organization is completely different. And uh, it's just, it's something that doesn't, it's not intuitive. It doesn't seem to make sense that you have two genomes to start with, and then they're, they're just completely differently organized. Um, and they're both essential for, for the function of the cell. Yeah. It's <laughs> well, well, thank you. It was really, really great having a, this conversation about um, your work on, on mitochondria. Thank um, you for having me, and hope you're enjoying the, the symposium. Yeah, that's great. It's been a fun couple of days, no? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> been, it's been nice. Thanks. Thank you.